So tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Carl Melantis to Politics and Prose. He graduated from Yale University and was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University before serving as a Marine in the Vietnam War. He is the best-selling author of Matterhorn and What It Is Like to Go to War, and most recently, he was featured in Ken Burns's and Lynn Novick's documentary series, The Vietnam War. In his newest novel, Deep River, Marlantis constructs a family epic at the center of which are three Finnish siblings, Ilmari, Matti, and Aino Koski. When they are forced to flee Finland in the early 1900s, the Koskis settle in the United States, specifically the Pacific Northwest. As they pioneer this frontier wilderness, the siblings must contend with rapid development, organizing a labor union, and the looming world war, all while reckoning with their place in a country that is forever defining itself. Bookseller Michelle Malonzo of Changing Hands Bookstore in Arizona writes, Deep River is a page turner. It's stunning, timely, and all-consuming. The prose is exquisite, the characters are fierce and robust, and more than anything else, the novel is a history lesson and a warning, as its portrait of the 1900s America is so startlingly similar to the present state of the country. Deep River is a revelation. Now, please join me in welcoming Carl Melantis. Well, thank you very much, and uh, congratulations. Uh, she just learned how to pronounce the names two minutes ago. Uh, 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 but there's a pronunciation guide in the book. She had the advanced reader's copy, so give her a break. Uh, but it was great, perfect. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm so happy to be here. I haven't been here since what it's like to go to war. Oh, yeah, okay. Is that working better? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's just a great pleasure. So I thought what we'd do is I'd uh, tell you a little bit about my background, why I wrote a book like this or was able to write a book like this, and uh, sort of what inspired the story. And uh, uh, then I'll read maybe five minutes and leave a half an hour for questions. So if you see me looking at my watch, that's why I'm doing it, so that I can leave the time. I grew up in uh, a little logging town on the Oregon coast, uh, Seaside, Oregon. It's now a, a tourist place because all the trees are gone uh, and, and for people that can't afford to go to Florida. But uh, when I was a child, um, literally I, could, I was in grade school and I could feel the floor tremble when log trucks went by. I mean, they were, they were loaded with logs, one log. It was, you know, from the floor sometimes up to the ceiling in, in diameter because they were still cutting old growth forest. And a lot of people think, well, that all happened in the 19th century. But the peak cut in Clatsop County, which is my little county, was in the upper left-hand corner of Oregon, right on the, where the mouth of the Columbia River is. Uh, the peak cut was in 1972. But unlike a lot of industries where it goes like this and then goes like that, when the wood's gone, it just it went like that. It was over. And uh, one of the things that inspired me a little bit to write this book is this uh, irony that I lived through, which logging is an extremely dangerous uh, profession. And so is commercial fishing. I think they're still the two most dangerous professions uh, in the world. I mean, you know, take a, you know, people that put out fires and oil wells and stuff, but normal jobs. Um, and... Uh, uh, when I was growing up, I had 60 kids in my class, and five of my friend's fathers died in the woods. I just, and it was sort of just the way it was. And earlier, it, it was even more dangerous. That was before there was safety rules, before there were unions, before all the stuff that got put in place during the time period of this novel. And the people that came and logged, you know, they're just our size, and these trees are monsters. And they took them down by hand. Uh, from dark till dark, 12, 14-hour days in the summer. It was shorter in the winter, a little more miserable. Chopping, two guys alternating. They were ambidextrous. They had to learn how to do it both-handed. Balancing on, on uh, springboards because when the, uh, an old-growth tree comes down, it flutes out like that. And they wouldn't take lumber that fluted out like that. You had to start above the flute and then go up from there. And they cut up to the first limb chopped them off and uh, that's the only log they took out because it, it was uh, one of those odd economic 
problems, which is that there was so much of it that it was dead cheap. I live in a house that's, uh, the walls are made out of vertical grain, clear. That means no knots fur. And it was cheaper than sheetrock when it was put in. And today, you know, you could make guitar tops out of that kind of stuff. So um, these people show up and they, they do this amazing work. And the irony is that the old growth forest is gone. And uh, the same thing happened on the Columbia River. Um, the, the, the dams and the building of the dams, and there, I get into it a little bit with one dam in the novel. Uh, just think about this. I have a friend of that generation, Tycho Finneman, and he, he told me the story. He said that he was on the first crew that arrived to build the Grand Coulee Dam. Four trucks, flatbed trucks, no roads. They're bouncing across eastern Washington. They get up on a bluff. The superintendent comes out, and all these guys stand there, and they're looking down, and there's the Columbia River. I mean, it's an enormously powerful river just flowing down below them. And he said he pointed down there, and he said, she's going right there, boys. And they built the dam. I mean, you know, they're this big, and they, I mean, 72 men died building the dam. And we go like that and we get electric power. And so trying to sort of think about all that and bring and, and uh, put that into the novel was, was part of, of what was motivating me. Um, the other thing, quite frankly, that motivated me, see, I'm looking at my watch, um, is, is uh, uh, my family background. And my last name is Greek. My father's first language was Greek. My mother's first language was Finnish. We're talking about, my brother coined the term cultural schizophrenia. I mean, we'd take Sophia, my, my Greek grandmother, up to Portland to the Greek Orthodox Church, and uh, we'd get in the church, and, Sophia, how are you doing? And the priest's up there doing the thing, you know, with the smoke and everything, and yeah, how are you doing? How are the grandchildren? You know, they're shouting at each other across the thing. And you go to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland, and it's just, you know, like that. And so I, I grew up in this culture, and uh, I, I could love to tell this story because it gives you a, a really good idea. So, um, and I can do it because I'm half Finn. Um, so uh, Tycho and Lena were married for 55 years. And sadly, Lena died. So they're at the funeral, and Tycho's in the front row in the pew, and behind him are two of his friends. And one leans over to the other and he says, you know, Tycho really loved Lena. He told her once. <laughs> That's the Finns, okay? They're really different than the, than the Greeks. Not to mention my biological grandfather, Leif Erikson. He is a Norwegian, oddly enough. And he's, his first language was Norwegian. And he spoke Norwegian to my mother. And... There was a divorce, and so my grandmother married a second time a Swedish-speaking Finn, Axel, who I named a character after. So there was Swedish, Norwegian, Finnish, Greek, and English. Well, the default was English. My brother and I never learned the other languages, but we could tell you the names of the cookies in all five. And, uh, um, and, and that was where, where I, what I grew up with was this sort of culture going on around me, the logging town. And... Um, a, a lot of stories from that generation, and, and I wish I'd have been smarter, but I was, you know, I, I fished. I didn't log. My friends logged, but I was on the fishing side of the community, and so I fished with my grandfather on the Columbia River. And the Columbia River, 10 miles from the mouth, is, is five miles wide. I mean, it's a big river. It drains from British Columbia, the Selkirk Mountains, all the way to the uh, Tetons in Wyoming and all the way south to the Nevada border. I mean, it's just huge area that it drains and it goes through one place, the Columbia River Gorge. And uh, uh, it, it, back in the day, it was a source of just an enormous amount of, of uh, salmon fishing. The banks of Astoria, Oregon are lined with canneries. I mean, there's none left now. It's, some of them have been turned into restaurants. It's just sort of, and I've, I've watched all that go on. Um, so getting these stories from my my grandmother's generation was also part of this novel and uh you know one was 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 my uncle yuka pavala who um, 
told me about the first strike, and I use that in the novel, they wanted to come back to a warm bunkhouse, and so they wanted to let a guy off a half an hour early from the crew, and they wanted to sleep in dry straw. And the, there was, the straw was full of bed bugs, it was damp, and they just, the straw was just thrown on boards, and they'd st- made three bunks high. That was just the conditions. They had to go on strike to get that. And uh, we today have live on the shoulders of these people because it wasn't just, you know, going on strike. There was just uh, an enormous amount of risk involved. I mean, if you went on strike, you could be fired, blacklisted, never get another job. And uh, that leads into my, my grandmother, who was a labor organizer in a way. She was very low level with the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. And... Um, she was a communist. And uh, I can remember, you know, we had the seaside signal where I grew up and then we'd go to Astoria. And there was what I thought was the local Astoria paper always on our kitchen table called the Daily Worker. And uh, I had, you know, and, and so my view of, of, of a communist is different than you sort of, you know, the, the archetypal view because she made c- cookies and she baked pies. I mean, that was my communist grandmother. Um <laughs> So, and one of the things that I tried very hard to do was to show a family that had enormous differences of opinions about politics, about religion, and yet they had Thanksgiving dinner together and could contain those differences. And what, in, in just as politics today, we've lost a lot of those containing, what I call tribes, your work tribe. Uh, we, we don't have a logging crew general or a factory crew that you can have the crazy communist in the crew and you can have the crazy religious nut in the crew and you all work together and you put up with it. It's just like part of the deal. Uh, that's been lost. And so the tribes, instead of being family or work or community tribes, uh, they are now become political tribes. And I think it's a, it's a trend that we should think about and I hope turn around because with social media, it just keeps getting worse and worse. And I think that we're not looking at the actual cause of it, which is the lo- we're genetically designed to, to be in tribes. I mean, I think it's genetics. It's like, here they come. They're going to take away our food supply. I mean, that's just something in us, you know, so we have to get conscious about it. And so a lot of the novels about that. One of the stories that I love to tell is my my communist wobbly grandmother uh, came back from college and I think there's some people in this audience that clearly are of an age that remember that Joan Baez song about uh, Joe Hill. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night alive as you and me. Well, he's this icon, you know, to me, a college kid. And I went, Grandma, did you know Joe Hill? And she literally stepped back. That son of a bitch. And my grandmother did not like to speak English, but she had these key English phrases. <laughs> and one of them was that. And uh, I, Grandma, I mean, Joan Baez idolizes him. I mean, you know, he's, and, and Joe Hill was an amazing song parodist and very important to the labor movement. There's no doubt about it. I, and she said, we would work so hard to get people to carry the red card. Now, the red card is just an IWW membership card, and I think it was $5 for a year, and that's how the, the union funded itself to do the organizing and so on. It was very important to the workings of the union, but they had to hide that card. I mean, if you were caught with the red card, you were fired immediately. So people hit them in their shoes. They, they hit them where, where they would hope they wouldn't be found. But they, had to, but they had to do it because it was part of the solidarity as well. It's like, yeah, I'm a card-carrying member of the IWW. So it was, it was a very uh, risky thing to do. If you were fired, you were blacklisted. And there was literally no way you could get a job. And there was no social safety nets. Your family would not eat. So it was scary. She said that, you know, headquarters in Portland of the IWW would decide to have a rally And she said, cops coming to the rally from all over the county, standing around, making everybody nervous. Joe Hill comes, sings a few songs. He disappears. Red cards torn up, thrown on the ground. Two years of organizing down the drain. Another phrase. And so I I thought to myself, gosh, there's a wonderful story, you know. And, And so that started me thinking about the novel 
And some of the other things that started me on, on this course is, is I've always been very interested in mythology. And, and uh, uh, Mrs. Witty, who was my local librarian, the library wasn't as big as this bookstore. It was like the size of half of this side of the room. And the other side was the fire truck. And uh, so there was this, the town's fire truck, and then there was the town's library. And uh, Mrs. Witty would call or write letters to the bookmobile in Salem in every two weeks. And she would start me on things. And she got me started on Norse mythology. Um, you know, there was a book, I think, I can't remember who did it, but the wonderful pictures, and it's a standard children's book here. Um, my grandparents thought it was a waste of time. I mean, they worked. They just worked. And, you know, if you, and, and they called me the professor. I have to, you know, I mean, they, they were, it was good natured, but they made their point, you know. It's like, oh, you're just reading all the time. Why don't you do something useful, you know? And uh, even when I was fishing with my grandfather, he, he'd call me professor, and everybody on the docks would call me professor. And I'm like 14, you know. I would get labeled with professor when you're 14. But um, one of the things that, that I, it started me on is, was, was the Norse mythology. She got me Yeats's uh, Celtic Twilight, which was just very important to me because, I mean, at an age, I was like nine or something like that, and it's about banshees and pukas and, you know, fairies in the wall causing trouble. And, and I was just like, wow, this is great stuff. Then I got into Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung, and it's a very important part of my writing, I, the symbolism that I use. And if people are tuned in, they'll see a lot of it in there. And when I was at Oxford, it was I, I reached the pinnacle of my nerddom. I uh, got talked myself into a class, and I had to talk myself in because I didn't speak three dead languages. It was called Old Norse Poetic Diction. Right? Yeah. I didn't even know what that meant. I don't know what... English poetic diction means. And, uh, and what we studied were the Norse sagas, and Lakshdala saga, Egil saga, Njal saga. And of course, they were studied in the original Nor Old Norse, and uh, I was studying it in penguin translations. Uh, but I got to thinking, I mean, like Lakshdala saga is a, a story of a uh, love triangle and about the settlement of Iceland by the Norwegian Vikings. And I started thinking, gee, it'd be nice to write a novel. I was always thinking about writing. Uh, uh, but I'll just have Finns come to the Northwest, and we'll sort of do a Lakshdala saga. And so that's floating around in there. And um, I got interested in the Kalevala, which is a Finnish, uh, you could almost say it's the national epic of Finland. It's like the Tain for the Irish with, you know, Cahulin and all those guys, and uh, Song of Roland for the French. And it's very important to finish national identity because the Russians controlled Finland. There was no country of Finland. They, they were just the Finns. They'd been under the Swedes, and then the Russians beat the Swedes, and then they went under the Finns. And uh, they were trying to Russify everything, which means that they wanted the Finnish language to just die away. And so if you wanted to do business with the Russian government or, or anything like that, you couldn't do it unless you spoke Russian. And my grandmother spoke Russian. Uh, she was pretty good at it, but her father built churches in St. Petersburg, uh, and he spoke Russian, and a lot of Finns spoke Russian. And another side that, that's interesting about the Finns, they were very radical. One of the reasons is they were under Russian control. So not only did you have the usual sort of problems of uh, rampant, unregulated capitalism and its, and its horrors, but also under the oppression of a foreign government. So they were further radicalized by the fact that there was a nationalist movement combined with a sort of a socialist movement. And the other thing that's really interesting is that they were all literate. You couldn't be baptized, or you couldn't be confirmed in the Finnish Lutheran Church unless you could read. And the church taught you how to read. And believe me, if you want to incent your kids to read, saying you'll go to hell if they don't learn how to read is very going to do a very good job. So all these things came over, poverty-stricken, the same as you know immigrants from Italy or Germany or wherever they came from, but they were all literate, unlike my Greek grandparents. And both of my, father, my grandfather, totally illiterate. My grandmother had second-grade education. So they, they could be further radicalized, newspapers, uh, socialist newspapers, you know, my character reads the Communist Manifesto, and, and uh, clearly my grandmother was was able to read all that sort of stuff. The Kalevala is a uh, was discovered by a guy named Elias Longrod, who was a Swedish speaking Finn. About fifteen percent of Finland speaks Swedish, 
And in the day, he, he became a doctor. And in the day, the Russians sent the new doctors out to districts that no one wanted to go to. And he was sent to the Kalava district, which is in the far east of, of Finland. And there he, he started to hear these really ancient songs. Um, and he began to realize that these songs had the same characters. And I was able to witness this singing once. It's called Swomi Hall. It's still there in Astoria. It's the Finnish Brotherhood. And it's two old men. And they would link their arms like this. And they'd look right in each other's eyes. And, you know, and to, to an eight-year-old, I, I wasn't sure they were going to have a fight or what was going on because they were fierce. And they would sing each other like this in, in Finn, in the old, old way, looking right in the eyes. And that's the way he started to listen to what they were doing. And he began to collect these songs, and he collected them into a, a book that he called the Kalevala. And that la in Finnish means from the place of. So from the place of Kalava district, pretty simple if you speak Finn. And um, it became a sort of a, a, a touchstone for Finnish independence. Uh, Finns began naming their children after these characters. And uh, it was the truly original Finnish uh, work of art uh, had nothing to do with Scandinavian uh, uh, heritage, or I mean, uh, or uh, you know, the gods which are Indo-European gods. I mean, Zeus and you know, the Norse gods and the Greek gods. Or you can trace each one back to an earlier Indo-European root. The Finnish spirituality was much more like Native American. It's wind spirits and river spirits, uh, much more animistic, and um, Sibelius took a lot of these early uh, songs and uh, wove those into his own music. And uh, Longfellow was very influenced by it. The meter from the shores of Kitchi Gumi, that's from, that's from Kalava. And that's uh, 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 something that, that is sort of, so it's, it, it had worked its way in just a little bit into American culture by the 1900s. And I thought, well, it'd be great to sort of, you know, retell the Kalevala. And so I outlined a way I was going to do it, and uh, it didn't work. <laughs> you know, because it's not, a, it's not a narrative structure. It's a series of, of, of these poems. And what they think is that they were celebrating very powerful shamanic figures from pre-Christian times, prehistoric times. So that's all thrown in there. The, if you know your Kalevala, which no, not very many people will. Each of my characters actually is is uh, influenced by, like Ilmarie is a blacksmith, and Ilmarinen in the Kalevala is the magic blacksmith who builds something called the Sampo, and the Sampo is this magic mill that grinds out prosperity and good for everybody. And um, again, the mythologists think it was probably the North Star because in Finland, it's up there instead of over here, and the wheel of the stars around it was the was the Sampo. And uh, each of my characters has something like that going for them. And each of my characters is also uh, very influenced by an early uh, tragedy in the family, which I won't go into because it spoils it. And um, they all have these radically different ideas about how to deal with the fact that they're mortal. And uh, I know becomes a, a, a communist and she, in a way she's kind of like my grandmother she's not my grand my grandmother's nowhere near as romantic as I know but um heaven on earth that was the way because she didn't believe in God this character I know but her older brother was just the opposite he 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 went the other way because of this tragedy he believed in a in a very just but kind of a hell and damnation Finnish Lutheran God and uh, another brother said I think money is going to solve this problem, this anxiety. So if I just get rich enough, I can stave it off. And and each of the characters, including the the people that I know, gets attracted to, and and in the course of the novel, you know, frustrates people because she's making the wrong choices. And and uh, she, uh, one reviewer said she's the most annoying. No, what was the word? It was the most uh, uh, frustrating uh, female character in American literature. <laughs> but he actually he loved the book. He just said, uh, just he was just going, no, no. Do that, I know, and then she would do it, and they said, "Oh God!" So you're warned. So I'm going to read just one passage from it, and and uh, this is where uh, Ilmarie leaves his friend Ulico, and Ulico's lost his wife and uh, child to childbirth. And one of the the things that I, again I learned that was really interesting is that when you ask a woman in the late 19th century, even the early 20th century, how many children do you have, the answer would be six, four living three, two living. 
uh, it was never, I have three. It was always how many and then how many were alive because they lost them at a, you know, all the time. And uh, we tend to forget how hard that was and how important that was. And, and uh, it, so my book sort of wants to sort of bring that to people's attention. So he leaves uh, his friend's house and he is going to meet Vasutati. And Tati means aunt in uh, uh, Finnish, like Maya Tati means Aunt Mary. And um, Vasutati is the last of the Inasal Indians and she herself is a shaman. And she's very important for Ilmarie's character arc because she starts to move him from a traditional uh, fire and brimstone Christianity to a much more mystical Christianity. And this is his first meeting with her. He said goodbye to Ulako and set out for Ilmahenki. That's his farm. He passed the grave of Ulako's wife, buried next to a copse of dogwood. Ulako had asked him to read the burial service, the nearest pastor was in Astoria, and although he came often, he couldn't always do so. Just a half a mile from Tapiola, Ilmery passed a huge lightning-struck snag, over 20 feet tall, whitened with age and scarred black from fire. Ilmery thought of God's wrath striking down from heaven. Why would God make a man prosperous enough to lend someone money and then take away his wife and baby? And why would he give and then take away Ilmarie's own baby brother and two sisters? And why was there hell? He thought of burning, screaming with pain forever. And how could God be so cruel? But he had sent Jesus to save him, so he wasn't cruel. He was just. He decided not to, to stop thinking because no one should question God. When he reached Ilmahenki, he saw a figure standing on the far bank barely observable against the wall of the forest that covered the high hills across deep river to the north of Ilmahenki. It was Vasutati, the name given to the old Indian woman by the Finnish immigrants. It meant Auntie Basket. Every two or three weeks, Vasutati made the rounds of the farms and logging camps, selling her hand-woven baskets. She was the last of the Inasal Indians, a small tribe of Chinookan speakers who had lived on deep river until they were decimated by European diseases. Ilmery hesitated, then raised his hand in a tentative greeting. She stood there for a moment, and then she too slowly raised her hand. It seemed to him that the distance between them, the river itself, shrank to nothing, and he was captured by dark, solemn eyes. Then the woman turned into the forest and disappeared. He continued toward the house in the twilight, puzzling over the incident. In a surge of longing, he imagined a wife coming to the door to greet him. He sighed and went in. The house had no curtains at the window, no cupboards to hold Sunday dinner dishes, and no furniture other than the utilitarian wood chairs. The knitted wool cap that his mother had made him six years earlier hung tattered on the wall. A good wife would have been embarrassed to let him out in public with such a rag on his head. He glanced at the dirt floor, devoid of the ubiquitous rag rugs that Finnish women seem to turn out in endless profusion, all the while catching up with their neighbors, gossiping, or just quietly weaving them before bed by the embers of the evening cooking fire. If he'd have tossed a pebble in the center of that house, its fall would have echoed off the walls and in his heart for hours. So that's Ilmarie's first encounter with who's going to be his mentor. Okay. We did pretty good. Five minutes over. <laughs> Question time. I'm a Finnish American um, whose parents. Uva Paiva. <laughs> Uh, who doesn't speak Finnish, um, <laughs> whose family landed in New York City mm -hmm. and was involved with the Finnish Hall there oh, really? um, yeah. at the turn of the century. And so I was wondering what difference you think it makes that the Finnish Americans, so and they were social, my, my people were socialists too. Yeah. Um, my grandfather taught um, Marx at the Finn Hall in the 1920s. Right. Yeah. 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 So what difference did it make? Um, to be in a rural place 
that was very much like the rural parts of right. Finland versus urban fin, Finnish mm-hmm. American experiences in terms of socialism. Right. Yeah. Um, well, it, I was when I started doing the research, I was amazed at how different it was for the whole labor union uh, movement. Because if you went on strike in the Northwest, you could go fishing and you could eat. I mean, you, and if you went on strike in New York City, the, there was no alternative. And so it was, it was actually easier. And the other thing that was different is that they weren't crowded into these tenements. And so they, they, they were actually on farm and they were poor. And the logging was awful. It was dangerous. The conditions were dangerous. But there was always that sort of relief valve, and it's part of just the American, uh, I think it's in our psyche, is that there's always a relief valve called the next place. And, uh, you know, just the natural, I mean, one of the characters in here says that, you know, we're just cutting down God's garden, but we didn't plant it. And uh, whereas the the Finns, all the immigrants that came to the cities of the East Coast uh, didn't have alternatives like that. So it was much more sort of put together or... Uh, much more focused and and difficult. Um, And uh, uh, that's one major difference. And I think that it probably, in the end, made it much more difficult for people to organize uh, a socialist party uh, in the West than in in the East uh, because of these safety valves that happened. So I think that was a big difference. Um, and, uh, but they, on the other hand, the, the co-op movement was very important in Oregon and Washington, sawmills, co- Finnish cooperative sawmills, and that was a sort of a compromise. It was like, well, we can't change the capitalist system, so we'll become capitalists, but we'll all, we'll all own the company ourselves. And so then our labor will, the, the, the fruits of our labor will come to us instead of some owner. And, uh, and so that movement was very important to the early Finns, and that, I think, was their compromise with capitalism and socialism because they couldn't quite make it go and i know who's a a wobbly uh doesn't believe in socialism because she thinks it's just talk and direct action is the only way to get things and the direct action the wobblies were very active in the mines in the in the logging industry the west i think they were also active in the textile mills in the northeast uh, but the Finns weren't as involved in that. That's all. So I don't know the difference. Yeah. Good question. Sure. Hi. Well, I'd like to uh, offer two words of thanks and a question. Okay. Um, the first thanks is for sharing so much with us today. It's like you have uh, kind of explored your whole family's immigration here and give us a sense of the richness of the novel. So thanks for, for sharing that. Um, thank you also for your book, Matterhorn which was an amazing novel of uh, brutality, challenge, and survival. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that was really an incredible book. My question is, how do these things connect? And, and so I'm wondering if you started in a place where it is about boys who are becoming men uh, trapped together, facing almost certain death, and how they somehow have to create a community and survive from that. Um, this story is very different. It's a classic migration tale of multiple generations and people, and there's oddballs and all of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you have also the uh, the sagas as another influence. Mm-hmm. So part of my question is, what happens to the violence of the sagas? The sagas are almost always resolved by some horrific violent act yeah. by a berserker. And the uh, I also have read a bunch of the sagas. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, and the war, of course, was the same way. How does violence run through that, and how do you connect these things together? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, the, the violence was, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the National Guard would show up and, and beat people over the head with axe handles, and, and, uh, uh, or they would deputize, you know, uh, citizens' committees. And so there was a great deal of violence in the labor movement in the early 19th, uh, 20th century. Um, but this novel isn't really about that. I mean, this novel is is about um, you know, as you said, the immig- you summarize it pretty well, um, and I think that the connection uh, between the two novels is that I'm just exploring myself, and uh, one of the things that is important about literature, and I think it's where it stands as an art form, is it's the only one that I really know where you actually get out of your own skin. You identify with the character, and you see the world through the character's eyes. A movie, you just see it through the camera's eyes. You, you know, it's it's you don't see it from the inside out. 
it's the same for a writer. So this story about boys growing up and, and becoming men and, and in difficult situations, it was about me growing up. And now I have a novel that's got a female character. Well, I've got that in me too, and so out she comes. And, and so the connection between the two is I'm still just dealing with my own growth, my own psyche, and I'm into di hopefully into different stuff than when I was 25. Uh, and so in that way, they're, they're, they're very connected. And violence actually... Uh, what's the way I say in the labor movement, it goaded people to make the compromises that actually worked. Uh, violence would solve nothing. It just makes people mad. And, uh, and I think that that's pretty clear, uh, not just from our own experience, but it just really, I mean, the booths that have it doesn't solve anything. But in the labor movement, there was violence. Uh, and uh, the Wobblies got labeled with it, but that was actually, I think, a, a false accusation they weren't uh they were uh, confrontational and they took a beating every time that, that the you know the national guard or the police showed up but many of them were put on trial for uh terrorist acts for murders not one was ever convicted and that, that was in a in a milieu that uh, they certainly would have been convicted if they had any evidence at all so my own reading of the history is that they made some terrible mistakes uh they went on strike when we were in the First World War because they thought, oh, now's the time because the government wants all this spruce to build airplanes. Well, they got labeled with being anti-American. And uh, that was a, a tragedy of the First Order because the Congress passed a, a law, and this is where it comes. I'm, I'm rambling off here. But anyway, the, they, they passed a law called the, called the Espionage Act of 1917. Uh, where they said if you uh, one of the clauses if you're found thinking about overthrowing <laughs> the government you go to jail it's still on the books yeah, be careful about what you're laughing about you know uh, it's still on the books just like that one that was waiting on the border for 50 years was never enforced the way it's enforced today but it's on the books so uh, I'm kind of going and how was that sold fear it was sold on fear of Bolshevism the Bolsheviks are going to come to America and they're going to, you know, destroy our way of life and they're going to overrun us. I mean, it's so familiar. I mean, it's amazing. And so we have the Patriot Act, which is sold on the fear of, of terrorism. I mean, like the Taliban is invading the beaches of Santa Monica. We've got to, we got to give away all of our freedom so that we can stop them. Um, how did I get off on that? Uh, you, it was about violence and that's, and that's, uh, that's what we're dealing with. But the, this book doesn't end with violence. Yeah, thanks. Hello. The whole, the whole Scandinavian American experience has been kind of undervalued, I think, uh, all the way from I Remember Mama, the, drama, the TV yeah. drama of the 50s, right. uh, The Immigrants in the New Land, two great movies, and uh, even uh, Garrison Keillor's uh, Unknown Norwegian. <laughs> At some point, though, when you were writing this book, did you just say to yourself in the current political climate, I've got a good family story to tell? And I'm going to tell it to uh, to uh, reject the people who are uh, uh, demonizing immigrants these yeah. days. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I was very aware of that, uh, but but I wanted to uh, to tell a story. I mean, that's what I do. I tell stories, and and if I don't tell stories well, no one picks up my book, and so or they throw it away. Uh, so. For, first and foremost, I wanted to capture what are the things I was talking about, the irony, the, the, the heroism, all of that stuff. And it, and it was my family, and I wanted to tell a story about a family. And yes, indeed, when do you stop being from the old country? When do you stop speaking old country language? When do you become an American? What is an American? All of these questions were going around in, you know, 1905, just like they are today. It's just we have a different group of immigrants. We've always had a different group of immigrants. And if you think about it, I mean, Native Americans were the first immigrants. They left where they were in Asia, went across that land bridge. Why? Seeking a better life, more food, better hunting. It's, it's absolutely the same story. Uh, and uh, just wave after wave, and that's where we are now. And I think that uh, we're so bad at history. I mean, you know, if we just knew that, oh God, this is iteration seventeen of this story, we'd relax a little bit. But we don't know that. It's like you know, history it was this morning, I think, and then whatever happened before that, we don't do. So yeah, I just wanted. To, uh, that's why it was. It was both clearly. Sure. 
Hi, uh, I first wanted to say thank you for, for being here. Um, and then second, I had a question coming from a place of kind of the craft as a writer, um, as a Charlie one four vet who actually read your both of your books before I read them. You were in Charlie one four. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> All right, Semper Fi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> read both your books and then read your citation at about three in the morning while on duty in our battalion CP. Um, this book clearly comes from a a place of kind of observed experience rather than a place of direct experience. And as a writer, how did you make that jump? Whereas Matterhorn clearly was was you speaking from your own experience and from the experience of people who you'd lived it with. And then mm-hmm. what it's like to go to war was even more biographical or memoirist. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Versus this, you seem to be talking from a place of experiences you, you, you weren't even alive during. And right. how did you, how did you kind of make that jump as a writer and in understanding and being able to tell such a compelling story about things that you weren't there for and didn't get to directly mm-hmm. observe? Well, for starters, um, the characters in Matterhorn are actually characters. I mean, they were kind of based on people I know, but I mean, like, Mellis is not me. Mellis is more like my older brother and a, and a kingmaker in Oregon who was a great politician. I mean, if I had if I had Mellis's skills, I'd have been the governor of the state, but I don't have that, you know. So in some ways, he's even though he sees everything that I saw personally as a as a non just you know as a marine, uh, he was a made up character. So it isn't that different. I mean, Simpson, I mean, I don't know. I didn't know any colonels. I was out in the bush, right? I didn't know any of them. I didn't know a general. I never met a general when I was over there. So I made them all up. So they're all, all the characters. And the, the way it works, it, it's kind of amazing. But they're all, like I was saying earlier, part of me. There's like, they're like little sort of in there, sub-personalities. The female characters, the male characters. And if you're in the zone, and I, I hope you experience this and have experiences, I write by hand. And uh, when it's going, I'm not there anymore. I really am not. I mean, it's like, and I, I'll wake up and I go, holy moly. And I've, I've been I know because she's come out from me. And I'm not trying to look at somebody in 1905 and guess what she's doing. I'm just writing and out she comes right from here. And uh, if it's going well, Carl, who grew up in Seaside, Oregon and was a Marine, he's gone. And then, then I'll wake up. And when it's going badly, I'm sitting in the chair and I'm going, ah, and that's what, when my ego's in the way and, 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 you know, three pages of crap. And I go try it in the next day. Uh, so it's really wasn't too different in the two novels. Fiction, if it's good, it's literature. You know, there's, there's commercial fiction, which is different. Uh, takes great skill. I mean, I do not, I, I outline several uh, uh, Danielle Steele novels so I could learn how she did it. I mean, she sold, she's a billionaire, right? Okay, <laughs> Matterhorn's going to have to sell a lot more books, you know. Uh, so it, it, that, that's, that's the process, and it wasn't that different. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, what are you planning on writing next? <laughs> okay. Um, what I'm planning on writing next is there's a character in, in here named Arnie, who is the uh. son of Matty, and he's the little boy in this novel. And he's going to grow up, and he's going to go to West Point, and he's going to become the military attaché to Finland because he's fluent in Finnish, and he's a career army officer. And he's going to get into a ski race with the Russian military attaché. But it's not about the ski race. It's about the reactions of the two wives. The American wife is a cheerleader, and she is rah, rah, I'm going to, we're going to beat the commies. And it's 1947, it's the beginning of this war, uh, the Cold War, and she goes to the newspapers. And the Russian wife realizes it's Stalin and Beria. If her husband loses the race, at best, Siberia, probably Lubyanka prison and worse. And so these two women have this conflict about their husbands who are, don't know what's going on at all. They don't know about the newspaper. They're just two guys racing. So that's the next novel. Okay. So, so is that like a... Sequel? And it'll only be this big. <laughs> it won't be like this. So is that like the end of the series or is there going to be like more than two books? No, I got about six in me. Six? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was a beautiful passage you read. Thank you. Um, I caught in the wintertime, it was on PBS. I don't know whether it was Frontline or Independent Lens. But it was, you were interviewed, it was a documentary, and they, you 
talked about your book, What It's Like to Go to War. Mm -hmm. And you discussed sort of the platoon mentality of that it's about the group. It's about the team. Right. And I was really struck by your comments. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to uh, maybe expand on that a bit. Because what really struck me is that seems to be, have become a problem in our society the advent of social media and you know yeah. taking selfies instead of groups or absolutely I, you know no i think that, that we always have had this war uh, war cultural difference that we flip back and forth between the collective and the individual and i mean you know the roaring 20s individual the new deal collective uh, eisenhower individual great society collective Ronald Reagan. Oh, man. You know, I mean, and and the, the fact of the matter is, is that both sides are right. Both sides are right. And we have to get that in our head that we make no good progress. If we were all this way, uh, you know, just uh, always, always uh, seeking change, we'd be even more stupid mistakes than we do now. But if we're always over here, you know, just seeking to be an individual, and not have anything to do with it, we'd make no progress at all. I and mean, it would just be sort of, you know, Hobbs, you know, whatever that what was it, the state of nature. Uh, so we we have to do it both. And referring to the marine experience, and I'm, it's 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 similar in many organizations. Uh, you really do lose your sense of an individual, and that is inculcated. Marine training is in, it tries to break it down so that you no longer think that way. You no longer think of me first. You think of us first. And it's, it's, it's fairly uh, <laughs> brutal, I mean, because the egos are hard to beat down. And, and so to say that, you know, we're going to do it in society without sending everybody to boot camp is going to be kind of hard. But on the other hand, I think we could sure use a lot more of it. I mean, for example, I think we ought to, you know, have a national service uh, because, again, it's just teaching kids that there's something bigger. Uh, and, you know, and there are people out there that you've never met. In fact... They're not on your social media page. And then uh, the story I like to talk about that is a, R Ray Delgado, uh, who is a, a Mexican-American from Texas. Um, he got a package from his mother. And uh, I said, Ray, what are those? I'd never, I had never met a Mexican-American, literally never in my life until I was in the Marine Corps. Well, Lieutenant, those are tamales. What are those? Uh, well, you know, you want to eat one? I said, sure. So he hands it to me and I start chewing on it. And literally I'm thinking to myself, wow, no wonder these Mexicans have such great teeth. God, this stuff's hard to chew. And they're laughing at me. I said, Lieutenant, you take the corn husk off before you eat it, you know? <laughs> and what, what that illustrates is I wouldn't have learned that if I hadn't been thrown in with Ray Delgado. See, and we're, we're in a society now where we don't do that. And, um, so the training, which teaches you that the group is more important for that job, the group is more important. The group isn't always more important. Uh, you know, there's times when the individual is important. And, and, but playing with it, being able to come to some kind of agreement instead of saying, no, it's always this way. No, it's always that way. And, and flip-flopping back and forth. And just being thrown in with other people and having the sense that what I'm doing here, whether I'm you know, working for the Red Cross or filling potholes in, in, in you know, the Forest Service trails or um, groping people at airports, you know, I mean, there's lots of work to be done out there that kids can do. And they can learn to be part of, part of a bigger community and learn that, gosh, this person is the same. Racism in America in the 60s was tackled institutionally by the freedom writers, by the people that fought for the civil rights acts. That was where it started. But honest to God, I think it was in the military where the rubber hit the road. And we learned that we could trust each other. We wouldn't have to be afraid of each other. If this guy could fire a machine gun, you didn't care what color he was. He just, he's on our side and that's good. And see, so all that was because of being thrown together. And I think that if we did something like that, it would really help this country. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I just returned from a month in Finland visiting my family. Mm -hmm. And I had the review of your book, so my young cousins that, that uh, of course, are fluent in English in reading it as I know well. it's embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Holland. You know, they all speak English. They've already you know. ordered your book at, the, at their library. Oh, really? Uh, and I grew up in Butte, Montana, which is, of course, copper mining. Yes. And when the mines closed, sort of at the end of the war, many of those people went to Oregon to work in the 
canneries in Astoria. Yeah. So, uh, and I actually lived in Oregon at one time, too. But mm -hmm. thank you. Whenever I... I'm always proud when I see someone hyping Finland because <laughs> it is a small country and you don't hear much about it. Yeah, there's about, what, five million Finns, I think. Yeah. yeah, It's not the size of the state of Washington. Yeah. Thanks. And one thing about those salmon can, it was, that, that was work done by women. And they didn't get paid by the hour. They got paid by the can. And they used knives. And if you ever want to see someone with a knife that is really, really good with a knife, it was these fins. And they're, they're them. I mean, that salmon, their salmon in those days were big like this, you know, coming down on a conveyor belt. You know, I mean, just like, it's unbelievable the, the skill of, of not, you know, cutting that fish and stuffing it into cans. And then they would all go outside and have a break, white, white things on their heads, white uniforms about, you know, every cannery had about 60 or 80 of them smoking cigarettes and then back in with the knives again. It was an amazing cultural thing. It's all gone now. We don't see it at all anymore. Sure. That's right. It was called the Iron Chink as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, they started doing automation. It was automation that, that killed that. Well, this is somewhat off topic uh, for, as far as Finnish Americans are concerned, other than you. <laughs> but I'm curious about how many of your Yale classmates uh, went to war. How many of my Yale classmates went to war? Um, <clears throat> one was killed, uh, Biff Fulberth, and uh, he was a Marine. Uh, but I would guess that we were probably one of the last uh, classes that. Uh, actually did uh, participate to a certain extent. We, we raised hands at the last reunion, and uh, about half of the hands went up. Uh, but most of them, I mean, I have to say, they didn't join the Marines. I mean, you know, they joined the Navy and the Air Force, and they served, but they, they, they didn't serve in combat. Uh, very few served in combat. Oh, and I'll tell you this final story. I, so here I am. I'm the, the Rhodes Scholar, right? And I gave it up because I just couldn't stand not being with my friends. I mean, it was really, and, and it was a horrible dilemma back then. You know, the war just didn't make sense. But I had already joined the Marines, and I swore to uphold the Constitution, which is a very good thing if you have people in the military saying, I think I'll decide what the policy is. Then you've got a banana republic. So it was a difficult thing. So anyway, I, I went over there, and I'm, I'm over there. And after I joined my platoon, I'm about... Uh, three weeks there and the, the kids, and they're literally kids. The average age was 18 and 10 months in my platoon. Um, the, uh, uh, Flaherty comes up to me. He's a 19-year-old squad leader, and he says, Lieutenant, are they shitting us about you going to Yale and being a Rhodes Scholar? Because <laughs> they couldn't believe that someone from Yale was I said, no, Flag, they're not shitting you. Well, you must be the dumbest fucking Rhodes Scholar on record. <laughs> We can end on that, yeah. <laughs>